Welcome, one and all, to another episode of Space This Week. The Monday rocket rundown regarding SpaceX's Starship launches at events we saw over the past week, a preview of all the things happening this week, and a rundown of all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. We've got launches from China, launches from the United States, and launches from the air, so I see no real reason to make like SLS and delay any further. Let's press on with the first segment to cover all the biggest development updates from SpaceX's Starship. SpaceX are still scrambling ahead with getting all the necessary infrastructure in place for their orbital launch attempt with Starship, Serial Number 20 and Booster Number 2. As we know, this will see the massive vehicles scream off the launch pad in what will be humanity's first ever flight of a fully reusable orbital class rocket. Of course, this will only be a test and as such, SpaceX aren't planning on having the first and second stage return to Earth in a reusable state. The massive first stage, powered by 29 Raptor engines, will perform a soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico, just east of the launch site, and then the Starship upper stage will perform a controlled descent before conducting a similar soft water landing just off the coast of Hawaii. So far, we've seen a lot of notable flights from Boca Chica, most notably, of course, being SN8, 9, 10, 11, and 15, but these were all single stage vehicles that were, relatively speaking, not particularly tall and cumbersome, so the launch platform setup was relatively simple. The full Starship vehicle, comprised of both the upper stage and the colossal Super Heavy first stage, will be a different beast entirely. This rocket will dwarf even the likes of the gargantuan Saturn V, and so SpaceX can hardly make do with this little metal stool to serve as the launch pad. Luckily, they are working hard to address this. Over the last few weeks, we've seen rapid progress be made to the orbital launch platform itself, this white-legged structure here, which will support the vehicle before its launch. The second component to the launch platform is the orbital launch integration tower, which will need to be big and tall enough to accommodate the Starship. Progress on this tower was always fairly slow, while the foundation works and initial concrete base were built, but now that's all done, SpaceX are rapidly extending the tower skyward using these big pre-assembled tower segments, the first of which was installed earlier last month, and we've already seen a further two segments added to that, with three more confirmed to be built and ready to be added. The current belief is that the tower will have seven to eight of these segments in total, since this many will bring it to about the same height as the full Starship vehicle. Brendan Lewis has showcased this great infographic showing the status of the launch tower itself and the quantity and whereabouts of the segments that are waiting to be stacked. Thank you, Brendan, once again for the amazing work. I'm sure you're all familiar with Brendan's usual work in producing these excellent infographics of the Starship vehicles themselves, and these are still being produced to the same great level as always. As you can see, SN20 is coming along very nicely, and BN2 is looking extremely close to the finish line as well. The little booster next to it is BN2.1, which is a test article that's currently undergoing a battery of assessments, including pressure and force testing, to make sure that the tank's construction is up to the task of supporting the immense pressures that those 29 Raptors will subject it to. The elephant in the room on this diagram is SN16. This has been sitting virtually completed in the high bay for quite some time, with no news on what, if anything, SpaceX will use it for. SN15, which now sits on proud display at the entrance of Starbase, fulfilled all the objectives planned for SN16, so it's sort of stuck in limbo in terms of what it could be useful for. It could be used as a destructive test article, or maybe as a platform for testing the eventual permanent and reusable landing legs for the Starship, but honestly, it's anyone's guess. I'd say it's unlikely that SpaceX would scrap a completed vehicle, but then again, they've been ruthless in their scrapping of previous prototypes and are dead set on the goal of Starship ship flying as soon as possible, and I have no doubt that they'd happily purge SN16 if there really was no way they could use it to help their campaign. Still, it would be a shame to waste it. Maybe if nothing else it could become like Starhopper and serve as a water tower or some other form of ground support tank. And speaking of the ground support tanks, these are all still very much being built as well. These will hold all the essentials required to support a Starship launch, but at risk of repeating myself, I'll leave it there since there's not a great deal to discuss with these tanks. They just store things like methane and oxygen. Anyway, I'm going to leave my coverage of Starship at that. It's all business as usual down at Boca Chica, but that business is definitely of the more exciting variety, and I can't wait to see how tall the tower rises over the coming days. But now, let's take a look at all the stuff we saw last week from elsewhere in the industry. 
Weighing in at over 85,000 kilograms without fuel and standing 65 meters tall, last week we saw the NASA Space Launch System Leviathan core stage placed vertically onto the mobile launcher in between its two already assembled twin solid rocket boosters. Finally, the SLS looks to be coming together, with the rocket largely now entirely complete. The core stage's block of four RS-25 engines successfully completed an 8-minute green run test fire back in March, and now it looks like the transportation to the Kennedy Space Center and subsequent unloading and reconfiguration look to have all gone well. This is the first time all three key elements of the rocket have been together in their launch configuration, although it is looking a little bit headless right now. <laughs> NASA still planned to launch the SLS on its maiden flight later this year. During this mission, it'll carry the Orion spacecraft toward the moon. At this stage, no astronauts will be on board, as it's part of a series of thorough tests of the entire space vehicle in order to ensure that it'll be safe for humans. Despite it only being a test, this launch will be one of the most awesome sights to see this year, so I'm definitely keeping my fingers and toes crossed for no more delays, please. <laughs> Over in the private sector, Blue Origin has ended the bidding for its first commercial passenger crew seat on board their new Shepard vehicle at a staggering $28 million. This flight will see the lucky winner sit alongside Jeff Bezos on the first ever crewed mission of New Shepard, which will be a brief flight up to the edge of space, providing incredible, albeit fairly brief, views of the Earth from space. $28 million. That is a monstrous amount of money. Luckily, it'll all be going towards Blue Origin's charity, so this frankly insane amount of money will be going toward a good cause. Hopefully, the ticket price's charitable nature was a big driving factor for its eventually astronomical price tag, and that as competition from other companies such as Virgin Galactic begin to emerge, maybe even peasants like you and I will be able to afford the trip to space one day. <laughs> By the way, unrelated, I'm very pleased to announce a new tier on my Patreon page. For just $28 million a month, you can get exclusive access to behind-the-scenes content and I'll send you a free signed block of foam. Donate today, please. Anyway, last week, Relativity Space unveiled their brand new, fully reusable rocket design the Terran R. Relativity Space have been striving to drive down the cost of space access through means of 3D printing and lowest possible part counts, so it's no surprise that their vehicle proposition is of the fully reusable variety. The rocket will purportedly have more payload capacity than the Falcon 9, just over 4,000 kilograms more to be precise. That's not its only one-up on Falcon 9 though. As mentioned, this will be a fully reusable vehicle, and Falcon 9 is only partially reusable. Of course, Falcon 9 exists Exists, but if this rocket comes to fruition and succeeds, then it could put a serious dent in the space industry as a whole and could even provide some serious competition for SpaceX's Starship, which is currently the only other fully reusable rocket concept. The race is on! Last week, we also saw some launches. On the 11th of June, we saw China launch a Long March 2D, which placed a Beijing 3 Earth observation satellite into low Earth orbit on behalf of China SpaceSat. The rocket also deployed three Chinese CubeSats to orbit, one for technology demonstration, one for Earth observation, and one a space telescope for asteroid cataloging. On the 13th of June, we had a very exciting launch of the Pegasus XL rocket. Pegasus is an air-launched rocket developed by Orbital Sciences Corporation and is now built and launched by Northrop Grumman. The launch last week went well. The payload, a US Space Force military satellite dubbed Odyssey, was successfully placed into low Earth orbit by the solid-fueled Pegasus. Unfortunately, no footage of this flight has been released. It only took place yesterday, so the footage on screen is of a Pegasus XL launch from 2016. The last bit of news I wanted to mention from last week was the Black Brandt 9 launch, which took place on the 7th of June. This was a sounding rocket carrying a scientific experiment investigating extragalactic background light on behalf of the Rochester Institution of Technology. And that's it for my coverage of last week, so now let's take a look at what to expect this week. But before we do, guys, if you are enjoying what you're seeing so far, then please do remember to hit the like button. It honestly really does help channels out. Anyway, let us proceed. <laughs> So far, there are four expected launches this week, two from America and two from China. The first is on the 15th of June and will be a Minotaur 1 launch vehicle launching from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, carrying the NROL-111 payload. 
a classified reconnaissance payload that, because it's classified, we don't really know anything about, other than the fact that the n 111 consists of three separate payloads. It's been a while since we had a Minotaur 1 launch, nearly eight years in fact, so this should be a fun one to watch. On the 17th of June, we'll see a Falcon 9 launch a GPS navigation satellite for the US Space Force to medium Earth orbit. The satellite has been named the Neil Armstrong and will join the current 31 active GPS satellites in orbit. What's particularly interesting about this launch though is that this will be the first Department of Defense payload to fly on a previously flown Falcon 9, as this particular booster previously launched a GPS satellite back in November 2020. SpaceX planned to land it on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship shortly after launch, so hopefully it'll see many more flights to come. The same day as Falcon 9, the 17th of June, China will launch the Shenzhou 12, the first crewed flight to the newly established Tianhe Space Station. This will be a very exciting flight to watch. I feel like there's something a lot more engaging about crewed missions, personally. The rocket itself is a tried and true Long March 2F, and hopefully the crew arrive to the station safely. On the 18th of June, another Chinese rocket will fly, this time a Long March 2C, which will place three Yeagen reconnaissance satellites to low Earth orbit. And that's it. I'm trying to keep my this week coverage nice and brief. Due to the variability and delay prone nature of rocket launches, I don't want to go too in depth in case a flight gets pushed back to next week and then I'll have to talk about it all over again on next Monday Space This Week. The rockets we're seeing fly this week though are fairly reliable, so hopefully that won't happen anyway. Only one more bit of the video to go now, a look at all the most interesting historic spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. <laughs> This is a pretty big week for firsts in spaceflight. On this day, the 14th of June in 1949, Albert II, or Albert II if you want to show some respect, launched aboard a V-2 rocket to an altitude of 134 kilometers, well above the Kármán line, thereby becoming the first monkey ever sent to space. He survived the launch and the flight to space itself, but sadly his capsule's parachute failed to deploy, causing it to slam hard into the ground, and Albert died on impact. His sacrifice was not in vain though. He and all the other animals that gave their lives to spaceflight helped steer us toward better and safer rocket designs that eventually humans could safely fly on. Rest in peace, you magnificent monkey. Also on the 14th of June, this time in 1967, Mariner 5 was launched on an Atlas Agena rocket towards Venus. Mariner 5 was originally built as a backup for Mariner 4, a Mars flyby mission, but after Mariner 4's success, Mariner 5 was modified for a Venusian voyage instead. The primary objective of the mission was to conduct a radio occultation experiment to determine the atmospheric properties of Venus. It found that Venus's surface temperatures and pressures were 527 degrees Celsius and 75 to 100 atmospheres respectively. The data from Mariner 5 and from the Soviet probe Venera 4 were combined to conclude that Venus had a very hot surface and an atmosphere even denser than initially expected. Communications with Mariner 5 ended in November 1967 and it remains coasting in orbit around the Sun. On the 16th of June in 1963, the Soviet Union launched Vostok 6. On board the capsule was Valentina Tereshkova, who, with the success of the mission, became the first ever woman in space. To this day, she remains the youngest woman to have ever flown to space and the only woman to perform a solo spaceflight. She initially worked in a textile factory and was a keen amateur skydiver, and it was this that gave her the skill set that led to her selection as a cosmonaut. Today, she is a member of the United Russia Party and was re-elected to the 7th State Duma in September 2016. Valentina's flight as the first female cosmonaut segues us nicely to the next anniversary of the week, on the 18th of June, when in 1983, Sally Ride became the first American woman in space, on board Space Shuttle Challenger on STS-7. During the mission, Challenger deployed several satellites into orbit. Sally Ride would fly on Challenger once more before leaving NASA in 1987. She tragically passed away in July 2012 after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at the age of 61. Also on the 18th of June is the anniversary for the 2009 launch of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a NASA-operated space probe that, as the name would suggest, headed off to the moon. 
Its goal is to help provide essential information for the planning of missions to the moon, and its sophisticated mapping program is designed to identify safe landing sites, potential resource deposits on the moon, characterize the radiation environment, and serve as a technology demonstration platform. So far, the probe has made a 3D map of the moon's surface at 100 meter resolution and 98.2% coverage, including 0.5 meter resolution images of the Apollo landing sites. It's still going strong, and here Here's hoping it continues to do so for many years, and hopefully it won't be too long before we can put its data on good landing sites to good use. The final anniversary of the week will be on the 20th of June, when on this day in 1944, the experimental NW18014 V2 rocket reached an altitude of 176 kilometers, becoming the first ever human-made object to reach outer space. Although the rocket reached space, it did not reach orbital velocity, nor was it designed to, and therefore it returned to Earth in an impact. While at this stage in development, these rockets were referred to as the A4s rather than the V2s, they were the same, and while the ultimate purpose of the V2 is nothing to be celebrated, not least because of the tortuous and lethal conditions of the prisoners who built them, they were the first major leap forward in rocket design since Goddard's early prototypes, and it really is the V2 that began to pave the way to the rockets that we see today. At least the final days of the V2 saw the rocket used for peaceful purposes by the United States to research spaceflight, such as Albert II's launch, which fittingly also took place at the beginning of this week. The first spaceflight of the V2 rocket was the final anniversary of the week as mentioned, which therefore brings an end to this week's history segment. <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Space This Week. I know last week was pretty dry for launches, but I think this week's hectic schedule should more than make up for it. Personally, I'm most excited for the Long March 2F launch, which of course will be carrying the Shenzhou 12 spacecraft that'll bring the first crew up to the new Chinese space station, which should definitely be a fun mission to watch. And Falcon 9s, despite how routine their flights are becoming, are still mind-blowing to watch when it comes to their landings. And all of that goes without saying a thing about Starship development, which is unfolding at such a rapid rate it's hard to stay on top of all the updates at the best of times. We should have lots of juicy stuff to talk about next week, I'm sure. Anyway, on screen there is now a scrolling list of my patrons who all help make this show possible. If you want to join their ranks, you can do so by clicking the link in the description or the link on screen. You can also join my channel by clicking the join button below the video and get some cool emojis to spam in the comments as well as a cool badge next to your name. Looks proper poggers and you get these videos on Sunday rather than Monday, so what have you got to lose with that? Uh, and there's also videos from my channel also on screen there's two of them hopefully at least one of them looks decent goodbye and i will see you